Well, welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on what part of the world you're from. Uh, thanks so much for joining us on another uh, monthly webinar, our 84th in a row at Town to Learning, where each month we cover thought leadership topics that matter inside of learning technology. We bring together the experts uh, to be able to have a real good discussion of education and, and real life uh, practice on each one. And, and today's no different. We've got a great uh, hour planned for you today to teach you a lot and bring some real life uh, experience in, uh, like always. Our uh, presentation today, or our webinar today, is how to transform your partner program uh, with, with channel training. And uh, it's such an important topic, especially in a year of the pandemic and of quarantine and of changing uh, how channel organizations need to interoperate with themselves and uh, integrate training. Uh, today's topic is, is really relevant to the complexity uh, that's out there because any given organization in any industry, you know, from tech to software to manufacturing, construction, financial, insurance, they all grow, they all thrive, they all compete in the marketplace through their channel partners. However, uh, what's different is that it's more complex uh, than uh, you would think inside of uh, the learning technology market. The challenge is, is that any given organization has lots of channel partners, all the way from the manufacturers, from the supply side to the, the end user on the demand side and everywhere in between. And organizations need to provide training out to all of those at the same time. But the challenge is those receiving the training have lots of organizations that want to train them. And so as a result, there's serious time constraints. There's just not enough bandwidth for everybody in the channel network to be able to perform as optimally as they should or you want them to, uh, to grow your organization. And that's where training comes in. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna learn about the ecosystem, how to identify it, what's it matter, what's that power of integrating into the ecosystem and the advantage of that. And then we're gonna talk about strategically about content strategies and of content approaches to engage uh, the channel partners of all the different types and how you can do that one off for sure, but how you can do that in a network sense so that you're you're addressing all of your channel partners simultaneously. That's the efficiency trick and the scalability trick we're going to spend a lot of time focusing on today. But just because you make the content and you have channel partners and you want to get their bandwidth doesn't mean that they're going to come and take the content. You got to engage them. You have to make it worth their while so they want to consume that content. And uh, we're going to talk about strategies to do that, real life strategies to do that, that work. And then finally, this isn't all for fun. Uh, organizations, though it is fun, uh, organizations train and strategically focus on their channel partners and training because it makes a measurable difference. It's something that you can see working almost in real time and then adjust course and continue to modify your plans to get more and more value out of that. And we're going to talk about that today, the impact of all this on competitive differentiation, uh, but also on uh, just business growth. So uh, we're talented learning. Uh, we produce this every month, uh, always bringing thought leadership to the market on topics of learning, learning technology, and uh, learning systems. And we focus on extended enterprise with partner and channel training really being a fundamental uh, part of what we do. This year, we just released the new talentedlearningcenter.com, which is now our online site where we bring together education, a lot of it on partner and channel learning technology, vendor neutral, even uh, certifications around uh, partner and uh, training technology, along with the vendor research all in one place. So that's what we do in the market. I'm John Lay. I'm the CEO and lead analyst of Talented Learning. Uh, all the way back in the 1990s, my first job coming out of of grad school as an instructional uh, designer, instructional technologist, I landed a job with a company where what we did is we helped high tech and communicate or high tech firms like Unisys and Compact, Hewlett Packard, and even SAP train and educate their channel and partner networks all the way back then with CD ROMs and kiosks uh, that we sent out or that we had on trade show. But I've been in it my whole career uh, of, of channel learning. So I'll try to bring that perspective today. But more important uh, than that is our host today, uh, Gavin Singh, who's the Vice President of Strategy at uh, BlueVolt. 
and Blue Volt for, we'll, we'll learn a lot more about them in just a minute, but one of the premier uh, channel and partner learning technology solution companies that are out there that grew up as part of that channel network and came up with a solution to do it better. So a great story uh, we'll learn about, but Gavin uh, leads the, the organization and the platform forward. As you'll see, he's highly experienced and innovative and goal-oriented uh, here with 20 years of experience in developing uh, solutions of all type, including uh, learning, learning customer and, and channel focused solutions. Gavin uh, has experience in, in a lot of channel and partner supply heavy industries, such as pharmaceuticals, healthcare, technology, and of course, what we're gonna talk a lot about today from a construction and a building and manufacturing standpoint probably because that's the most complex of all of them, so we'll be able to cover it. So, Gavin, uh, welcome to the Talented Learning webinar. Thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks, John. I'm excited to be here today. Awesome. Thanks for that kind of introduction. Oh, oh, thanks for joining me. Why don't you tell us who Blue, Blue Vault is, what you guys do in the industry, and attendees, you'll see how this is relevant here in, all, in about one second. Yeah, no, that's that's a great place to start. So um, one of the things that folks don't know about Blue Bolt is we didn't start as a tech company. We actually started inside the industries. Um, about 20, 21 years ago, back in 1998, uh, we started off at, in a distributor. So we know the industry from the inside, and we built what we're going to talk about today, that ecosystem, that, that learning um, um, from within. So it worked out very well. A lot of distributors and retailers and suppliers loved what we were doing, and in 2002, we we came, we became our own company. So we we formed our own company, and um, we've been doing it ever since. So 20 years experience just inside this space, the industries. Wow, that, that's uh, that's great. There's just from a you know an analyst perspective, what we do at Town Delario is we you know, we cover the industry, and you know we cover the the competitors and the solutions that are in it. And it's really unique from my perspective to see a, uh, an organization that comes, you know, from the inside that builds the software. So many times it's from kind of a different perspective. And so, well, as you'll see today and as Blue Bolt customers see, you know, that, that perspective uh, means a lot uh, when, when you come from the inside. So we're going to start off. Uh, today's presentation is kind of like four little mini sections here. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cover... Uh, the, the key points of today and, and starting with ecosystem. So, you know, our job at Talent to Learning as learning analysts is, you know, we study the marketplace and, and the solutions in the marketplace and how we earn, you know, some of our revenue, our, our primary revenue from a consulting standpoint is we help organizations find the best learning solutions to so define what they really need and find the best learning solution for what they're trying to do. Inside that process, which I do time and time again, the most challenging piece or one of the most challenging pieces is understanding the ecosystem. What are the moving pieces that are already existing that the learning system is going to have to morph into? And out of all the types of opportunities that we help our customers with, channel and partner are the most sophisticated and most complex and most scary because they have so many different components that are part of a channel program. And so there's so many, think of gears intersecting, there's so many different places. And uh, in the recent Forrester report on their channel uh, tech stack, they said 90 different programs, the average partner program has. And so that 90 different programs impacts learning, it impacts you know, the organization, because that means that the organizations are seeking a more holistic strategy that can go across all of their different components. And more importantly, they need to share the data from all of those components to have any chance of success. Because without sharing the components of, of, of their 90 or the data of all their 90 components, there's manual intervention. And when there's manual intervention, everything falls apart. So Forrester uh, came up with this channel software tech stack. They do it every year. And I think this is the maybe the fourth year, perhaps, uh, that I've been paying attention to it anyway. And it keeps getting bigger and bigger and more expansive every year with now 183 companies playing in this space. Almost $3 billion uh, worth of revenue on the tech stack. So I'm impressed. I know it's uh, complicated. Every organization has a different subset of these systems that they're using to run their life and their partner channel program. And that's what makes learning technology and, and training so tough in this industry. So Gavin, 
What do you think about this? Is this represent, representative of what you see in the industry? I know you're on this chart as, as one of those 183 fighting away here in, in channel and learning readiness part. You know, what do you see out in the industry and how relevant is all these different type of systems to, you know, your normal client? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, being that we, we came from the industry, if you look at these different areas, it's, it's the whole buying chain, as we call it, right? You, you've got to have the learning, which is where you start um, all the way down to actually selling. So if you go through these, you'll see that our Blue Vault specifically, because of the kind of customers we have, we're either directly in some of these other ones or we integrate with some of the best of the best in that, that, that area. Um, you know, a lot of software, they are becoming specialized. So you have to work within these bigger tech stacks to get your information and all the data together. So, you know, with Blue Vault, we, we have to be adaptable <laughs> and integrate with everybody that's out there. Um, uh, there's gonna be no, no less software out there. I think there's gonna be more at the end of the day um, as people specialize in different areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I agree. I agree. I think an, another layer of the challenge is that if you look at these different layers of, you know, channel learning and readiness and then the marketing automation and incentive management for all the software that's listed here, there's commonality with learning software. I mean, certainly learning software does a whole bunch that none of the other does, but there is commonality in, in functionality. So in addition to integrating with these systems, you know, it's the complexity of, of, figuring out what system you want to do a you know a particular task inside of here so uh, if it was even just as easy as selecting what you know which of these systems you had to integrate with but the common functionality and figuring out what system you're going to do it in it provides a another whole layer of challenge but no matter what industry that you're in and so i have the advantage of talents of learning to work across a lot of different channel and partner uh, type industries that that i mentioned before the names and the types of partners change essentially. So software, you know, resell, you know, have value-added resellers, for example, is a real common way to distribute and you know promote that. Or insurance and financial companies have independent agents, among other ways, to do that. Other organizations, retail, hotel, hospitality, you know, uses the concept of franchises, you know, as their core partner. But every industry is different. But in all the industries that I've run into, manufacturing and construction uh, probably have some of the most complexity. And Gavin, I know that's you know, the, at the core of your and Blue Bolt's experience. Why don't you tell us more about defining the channel in that industry, just to give us an idea of what you're up against and, and what your typical clients are up against. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, there's a lot of commonality between a lot of industries, but uh, this area is is very unique in some aspects. Um, you know, if you look at the, the buying chain, right, you're trying to get to the end user, the suppliers and manufacturers trying to get to the end users. And I think that's for most companies, um, whether you're in finance or healthcare, you're trying to get to that end user. And there's a few steps in the middle, right, uh, between distributors and co-ops, retailers, and all the different players in that. So it really comes down to how do you get your brand, how do you get your message, how do you get your product out there to the end user, right? Uh, so as you look at some of these software in the tech stack, that's what you're doing. You're trying to get your user. So you mentioned one there about marketing, right? Marketing is a huge business by itself as, as represented here. Um, that's where you start, right? A lot of times it's you throw it over the fence on, on a variety of different platforms and you hope and pray that somebody understands what you're trying to say. Um, it is a little bit of learning, but you're trying to do that, that, that one second, right? But one second, two seconds, three seconds, throwing an ad across is not really showing anything. Um, you know, where, where we tend to shine, and I think a lot of companies are realizing this, is you, in order to really to get somebody to understand your product, you've got to give them enough information to understand your product. Um, you know, one of the things I, I forgot to mention earlier, where we started as an organization, um, back in 1998 within that electrical distributor is the idea was very simple. If somebody knows about your product, they're going to sell that product. It's that simple. If I know about something, I'm more comfortable to talk about it, right? Um, and thus, Blue Vault's 20-year history is based on that very simple idea. So as you talk about the channel software tech stack, all of the software is the commonalities. We're trying to get information into the hands of the learner right, into the hands of the buyer, the end user, the contractor, or the consumer, or whomever it may be. And that's what all these solutions do at the end of the day. Some of them are a little bit more post-sales, but at the end of the day, you're trying to get information in somebody's hands. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And where that's different, uh, you know, from just, you know, for, 
those that HR and and you know training employee focused folks that are on the phone today you know there's you can train your channel independently or sometimes you know you can expand your learning system from your employee learning system uh, to, uh, to to train that channel but re regardless of how you do it the the difference between that and, and employees is the date that voluntary nature of this audience of you can't tell them what to do and they need that information to do their job but you you can't force them to do it and so you know that's the difference between like a learning and a partner type channel is that that focus on how to try to take these different audiences that are critical to your success but you can't tell them what to do you can't force them to do anything and so that's kind of one of the, the main big challenges of these different audience groups is you know, if you can't force them to do it then you know what do you do? How can you encourage somebody that doesn't have enough time to spend time to learn about you before they become a partner, to spend time to onboard uh, their whole company as part of the partner program, so their program with individuals, how to you know, really accelerate their employees to be able to know enough about your products and I guess your competitors' products to, to sell efficiently and, and to do it. But in an employee learning environment, it's about growing somebody from college to the boardroom. But for a partner and those voluntary learners, it's about helping them grow to, from a revenue standpoint, from a couple hundred thousand to $30 million a partner. So it's about that growth in terms of the revenue in your business. And that is you know, a, a big challenge of, you know, from uh, all different kinds of channels in, in all different kinds of industries, how to get those partners up on board, self-sufficient, giving them that continuing education that allows them to grow, 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 and be more efficient with your brand and your products and services uh, over time. Gavin, what, what do you think about that? Is Are these challenges right here the ones that you see in manufacturing and construction broader space in your ecosystems? Are you seeing different ones? What are your thoughts? Oh, no, you're absolutely right. You hit the nail on the head. I mean, from the beginning to the end, you're trying to train every aspect, right? Um, you're training every aspect, the distributor, let's say, if you're a manufacturer trying to train the, the, the channel, uh, they're trying to train the next channel, you know, they're trying to train everybody down. So it's not just about training the end user, it's training everybody in that process, in that buying chain, down until you get to that person. So you're trying to convey what products do, you're trying to convey all that information in a very, you know, uh, specific, to the specific users, right? The folks that are selling it, you're trying to make sure you get uh, the, the, the benefits of the product. Um, uh, you're absolutely right. You're trying to train everybody through the whole whole buying chain on what's going on and what they need to tell the next level down. Well, no wonder it's difficult because you know that's a lot of different audiences that need the same content but a little bit different and a little bit of a different application of it. And uh, as it turns out, that same content in a lot of cases, you know, is replicated across those different audiences. So how do you do that? You know, how can you, you know, how can you efficiently support multiple different types of partners simultaneously? And that's what you guys basically conceived as you went from being a distributor to being a software solution uh, organization. Why don't you tell us about that? This is unique in the industry from my perspective. Yeah, and you know, you've talked about it a little bit. So. Um as we talked about from the manufacturers through all their different channels, distributors, retails, buying groups, co-ops, uh, down to the actual end users, in our case, the professional trades, so electricians and plumbers, specifiers, engineers, everything across, you know, getting that information through each one of those levels to the next level is the most important thing. You're trying to uh, get that information and prepare them, make them ready to be able to talk about your product or your um, your service or whatever it may be, so they can more effectively talk to the next level down. You know the buying chain and its value. Uh, it's 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 complex, like you said, right? It's trying to get everybody on the same page, having that mind share, right? So they know. And a lot of times, you know, if you're the manufacturer, the supplier, the creator of that service, you know everything about it. But once you leave the manufacturer space and you go into the retails and distributors, you're trying to train them to talk about products that they that's not their own, right? They're not only training about yours; they're potentially training about a lot of other products. So how do you better get yourself uh, that competitive advantage over your competitors potentially, right? Mm -hmm. To get somebody to talk about your product the same way you will, 
right? And how do you get that person to get the people selling that product, right? The value added resellers to do the same thing. Um, and that's where we, 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 we tend to shine and we think we're unique is that we have that ecosystem to push all that down in our partner program, say, okay, here's a manufacturer and they're able to connect to all their different channels, all right? And push that content down. And we'll talk about this uh, um, a little later, I think, is that getting all that data back also. So with us, it's not just throwing it over the fence and saying, hey, yeah, I threw that ad up on YouTube or on X, Y, and Z. It's getting all the data back, getting information back from all your channel partners and say, hey, I think this or I think that and continue to iterate, right? Your go-to-market strategy is very important to the success of your company, right, when it comes to partner programs. So how do you get some of that feedback, not just anecdotal evidence? It's, it's, it's tracking that from beginning to end and seeing that come back because ultimately with partner programs, it's got to turn into sales and revenue, right? We're not just doing this for the fun of it, although it's fun, as you said, right? And I truly do believe that we're doing it for a purpose and that purpose is to see the revenue at the end of the day. So all through the buying cycle, as you see in this image here, um, it's it's not only moving data, but it's there's money moving around behind this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is in interesting. So just from perspective uh, audience, What's different here, or what I see different, it, is is in terms of an approach. So, say you're manufacturer A, you might have distributor, you know, everybody on this. And so, if you wanted to do a partner program, you know, one approach that you could take is creating your training and focusing on setting up, you know, the connections with each one of these. You know, getting them in the system, their employees. You know, get them to the content, manage them all the way down to the professional trades or whatever. But the thing is, is that these professional trades associations, the buying groups, the co-ops, the distributors, they already have lots of manufacturing and products that they need to snap into. So the question is, do they go to a different network for every conceivable manufacturer and supplier and do their training there? Or what Blue Bowl was able to do is you basically create the broader industry network and then allow you to snap in all the different pieces that are relevant. So you can have manufacturers, you know, one through 50 and distributors one through 50 all in the, in the same ecosystem. And that complexity, that ecosystem is possible in a partner program and pretty much not any other type of corporate uh, learning system. But if you can think broader than just that one-to-one -one connection, now your industry and your whole ecosystem is really singing. To buy that, Gavin? Yeah, no, you, you hit the nail on the head again, John. That's exactly <laughs> what we do is, um, you know, the network we've created, it, it, it is truly an ecosystem. Um, when you join that Blue Vault network, um, you are getting a decent number of your distributors or channel partners or suppliers via your line card, you know, day one. You're not going out and hustling to get that information to say, hey, Company X, can you give me some information? Company Y, can you give me some? It's all consolidated in one place. It, not only for you as 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 a, as a distributor, retailer, uh, co-op, etc., but for the manufacturers, they're able to touch all of the different aspects of their channels in one mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's actually very rare. We're not giving you an empty box. We're actually yeah. putting stuff in that box when we hand it off to you. The other 999 uh, available learning solutions. Maybe not all 999 of the thousand of them, but generally they're giving you an empty box and it's up to your responsibility to fill that box. And that's, I guess that's the point that's different. Tell us about uh, Leviton. I use them in all my outlets in my house here as I replace them. How'd they use you? Yeah, um, Leviton's an interesting story. It was a great story. You know, uh, like many organizations, they had multiple homegrown systems, you know, they had no consolidated reporting. And like we started talking about those relationships, right? Um, they, they had all these things, so they couldn't see what was going on. It was like, all right, we're throwing it over the fence. We're hoping it's going out there, and we're trying our best. So, you know, where when they came to us, um, we basically said, okay, hey, we can consolidate all this down. Let's get all your training, get rid of all those systems one place. So not only do you have a catalog of what you're trying to put out there in the world, uh, as you mentioned, all those uh, light switches and, and plugs out there, amongst the many other products that they, they sell, but we got it one place. But then they also got to see all of that training go out into the world, into the channel, whether it be uh, buying groups like iMark or their multiple retailers or distributors out there, they could see all that data out there. Now, one of the things, you know, everybody else says to me, oh my God, that 780% increase. You don't see numbers like that. You've got to be lying about it. No, that's because the potential was there 
but because it was so fragmented and you know just completely taken apart nobody was able to surface all those opportunities and that's what we we're ultimately able to do it's an insane number but it's an awesome number because it's there it's there for you to just pick it up if you're able to understand what that ecosystem and what your what's going on amongst all your channel partners and that's what they were able to do by bringing it into the blue bolt system right they got rid of all those all those other systems which as you you know as well as i do there's a cost of that right all those homegrown systems and the resources behind it so they got to consolidate those down they now got a whole wealth of analytics and reporting to track where their products are going and they're building strong relationships more than anything else what i always like to tell people is yes we're software but we're more than a software we're helping create relationships right we're helping to strengthen those relationships in many aspects and that's what happened here they were putting out all this information out there and they weren't seeing what's going on now they had insights right they're surfacing those opportunities they're getting all those insights to see oh wow if we only make this change we can see x y and z they're starting to think about the future of their business as trying to live in the presence of their business so yeah. this was one of those great ones where i was you know we're all blown away by the success of what leviton has had within the network mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you just told an organization that you're leaving 10 percent of your revenue or 10 percent of your upside you know, on the table by not doing this or not doing that. You can catch most executives' attention on that. Um, but if you told somebody that they're leaving 700% uh, on the table, you know, it's enough to make you jump out the window. And that, that's why uh, just channel and partner training is such an exciting field inside the learning systems marketplace is it's serious. I mean, this is competitive uh, differentiation. But uh, Leviton has competitors uh, that, you know, make outlets and, you know, electrical apparatus like that. And so, you know, it's not a foregone conclusion that, you know, the people down on the, that are closest to the end buyers of this, you know, have choices. Do they sell Leviton? Do they sell, you know, other uh, type of, uh, of content? And, you know, is it easy to sell Leviton? You know, you know, what are the features and benefits and the price and the value of that in comparison to the other? Um, you know, because at the end of the day, and Gavin talked about this, Salespeople, and I'm a recovering LMS sales guy, so I'm I'm speaking from experience. But sa salespeople will sell what they know because in the heat of the moment, it's kind of scary, you know, not having the right information or you know people know more than you when you're trying to represent a product. And so most salespeople aren't going to go into an area where they're not comfortable and and try to sell that and pretend. It's much more natural to sell what you know, and that all comes down to content strategies and trying to get that limited that limited time that uh, the channel has to devote to you as compared to their real job. And so here's another fast facts for this section from Gartner, uh, who does lots and lots of studying on B2B sales rep and selling to businesses and channel sales. And they came up that there's only a 5% time that B2B sales reps uh, have to influence a buyer during their journey and the buyer spends 95% of their time doing something else. And so when they're about ready to make a purchase, they only have 5% of the time. So being educated and making the most of that 5% is really mandatory if you wanna to sell Leviton as opposed to any other competitor. And not only that, but the potential buyers, they really spend just a small portion of their time meeting with the actual manufacturers and suppliers of, of this type of stuff. And so, as a result, all those middlemen that Gavin talked about, they need to, to be super smart and educated and be able to articulate it in a super amount of time or short amount of time where they're not going to make uh, essentially any sales or, or not make any easy sales. So all of this, you know, my takeaway on all of this is that what's on the shoulders of channel and learning or channel learning professionals is not only do you have this complex ecosystem that you have to worry about, but those time constraints make it so that the, your training and what training you create and where you impact that training as you know, one of the, the most critical things you can do to, to, to try to get the most of that 5% so that you can actually succeed. So what we see at Talented Learning across all the different types of organizations we work with are these general 10 type of efforts uh, that are the low hanging fruit that a lot of channel organizations do. The way I like to think about it is that a channel has a life cycle, uh, a channel partner from attracting that partner 
to onboarding that partner, to continually developing that partner, and eventually turning that partner into an advocate, uh, you know, a vocal advocate for your brand. And so smart organizations really create training that impacts uh, across all of them. So from, you know, onboarding partners, from trying to provide training out there to attract them or steal them away from other organizations uh, by partners being able to visually see that your training and certification program is a differentiator since they can choose unlimited partners themselves or certain partners. You know, having that as a differentiator is you know, a way to attract new partners all the way to reinforcing brands, brand change when you go globally or mergers and acquisitions. This is where the dollars are going to, to train. Why? Because it can all make a, a measurable difference. Gavin, I'm talking too much. What do you see in constructing and manufacturing? Are these the same type of efforts? Are you seeing other efforts that are more important based on your, your perspective? Yeah, no, you're, you're right. Um, so as you said before, you know, only 5% of, of the customer's time um, uh, do they spend Right. So instead of throwing that hundred thousand foot level and just throwing everything at them, you know, you can create specific and direct training. Right. You can give them that direct information. Don't waste their time because everybody's busy. They've got a lot of other things to do. So uh, when you're looking to do this stuff, it's be specific. And that's what we try to do. You know, we try to encourage our, our customers to do is be specific. If you're talking to a specific person or the sales folks or the engineers or the end user, have specific training because they've got all these things. So when you talk about you know, onboarding partners. Well, how are you onboarding them? What are you telling them? You're trying to tell them information, as you mentioned. You know, yeah, there's lots of competitors to every product out there, but what are you trying to say to a salesperson selling your product um, at the distributor level? Be specific, right? Create those training plans, create that information so they know how to sell what they need to sell. That's going to be very different training than, than the engineer or the actual tradesperson, right? Um, the electrician that's installing it in our Leviton case. There's going to be different training. It's how to install or what are the benefits. Um, you know, as you go through all these things with new product rollouts, you're going to talk to everybody differently. You know, uh, brand management, that, that's always something keen on everybody's mind. Keep your brand out there. Keep that mind share out there. One of the things with training, which unlike just advertising, is you can be specific, right? You can be specific. You don't have to take six hours of somebody's time to tell them about your product. You can take five minutes and give them the highlights, but talk specifically to them. Be very focused and you can get all that information back. If you're listening to your customer, you can get all the information back and then make iterations accordingly. Um, you know, but to be honest, our, our customers, they've got a broad range of unique needs for their training efforts. So, uh, you know, some focus more on different areas versus other areas, but we address all these efforts through, you know, the sharing center at the end of the day. Who do you want to get access to? Who is listening, right? Who are you going to listen to? You know, in the simplest terms, instead of going one by one to every one of your buying chain partners, um, of course the phone rings, um, instead of going one by one to every single one second. Got all the dings and beeps turned off except that one phone. But yeah, to finish your thought, instead of going one by one, you know, to do it like we've been talking about at, at scale, I think if there's one thing, Gavin, I would love you for you to audience to get out of this thing is to think about that scale. That's the hidden opportunity. That's the 700% that's sitting up there is scaling the thing to all the different types of partners in your value chain. A lot of times in learning technology, you know, we talk only about the sales and the value added reseller partners, but not all the different partners. And so that that's where the, the value comes from. But there's a lot of different content types. And this is kind of an interesting, uh, Maybe obvious, but not so obvious just because of the last year where Kevin and all these all things, you know, changed in the last year on, on how you think about it. But, you know, in in my circles, what I find is that partner and channel learning uh, a lot of times or channel and partner learning, uh, you know, a lot of times up until this year was, was still a real focus on on live on, you know, sending trainers or brick and mortar type things. Not all of it, but a lot of industries still really relied on that uh, on that live touch. And with that live touch being you know erased essentially, or at least in-person live touch over the last year, lots and lots of partner and channel programs and learning programs had to adapt and had to think about you know what content types made sense. 
And so there was, you know, lots of scrambling with organizations that maybe weren't prepared for different content types or delivering and different media and so forth. And it caused some consternation. And so Gammon, you know, in, in, inside the circles and your client circles, you know, how how did that, how did COVID essentially or quarantine impact uh, the content types that, that organizations are now choosing or can, are evolving to? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, and thanks for that uh, quick catch on me for there, John. Um, <laughs> uh, working from home these days is an interesting thing with all the sounds. Um, but yeah, so it's all about scalable. And to answer your question now, uh, you know, virtual events have become a thing, right, during pandemic. So those personalization at one-on-one -on -one, um, is no longer there with the in-person events. So uh, virtual is definitely a thing that's come, come to be more, I think, um, more available, more relevant today with everything going on. So... You know, taking all that training that we talk about putting together, you can you can roll all that into your 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 virtual conferences and virtual events, so you can engage with your customers, right? Um, we we do that through our platform to allow for all that training you've created to bring it forth, right? You can still have that one-on-one -on -one with many of your customers. We have a plethora of different options these days for our software, but you've got to get them one place. Say, hey, we're still doing this, and here's the structure. Here's what's going on, and we're trying to get all the brand out there. You know, they're talking to your, your, your sales folks and your distributors, you can get their content very specific, very personalized, um, or your, your specifiers and engineers, uh, you can get all that content out there. So it's a way to connect with folks um, now in this, this particular time, time that we're living in with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can still have that live component, which is a lot of times folks think from a virtual perspective, oh, it, it's all just pre-recorded and that's what it is, but with the virtual conferences, you still have that live component, plus as we're doing right now, right? We're having that live component. You can still listen to us, present to us, or present to folks, um, and get questions and answers and feedback from, from folks. But you can also do one-on-ones, right? Um, you still have that live component, although it's virtual. As you see with home phones ringing, we can still have all that live live interactions. It's not just you know on-demand training or pre-recorded training. It's, it's all of it. You bring all of it together one place, and put it out there live plus online, you know, plus um, uh, on-demand training. I mean, yeah, yeah. And uh, I asked that, this question or a very similar uh, type question to a lot of different experts on uh, the types of content. And I think probably the biggest theme that I get back is yes. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's not very helpful, but yes, we need it all because we got all different types of learners and all different learning situations from in the moment a need to, you know, more formal training plans and so being able to combine all of those different media uh, for sure is uh, you know is a mandatory having the short nuggets all the way to the training plans we'll, we'll talk about but just a real quick thing on virtual is really there's the virtual events kind of what Gavin was talking about and then there's also more using zoom and go to meeting and teams for more of you know replacing some of the smaller scale instructor-led events. Both of those lead to different requirements as it turns out inside your learning system, which is why you know, organizations you know, caught on their back foot may not support one or the other. Um, but one last comment on virtual events that I don't think anybody expected. So we help a lot of organizations think about virtual events the last year, associations, you know, they have lots and lots of uh, learning events on there. But the, the surprising upside is exactly that most virtual events did way better than the live events because since there wasn't a live component everybody knew that the virtual component would be higher class in just a given organization and a lot more international and broader people would attend when they knew they weren't going to be missing or it would be substandard being virtual versus being live and so a lot of organizations were actually uh, surprised here on, on the upside but we just did uh, a podcast uh, here last week with Rob Mo, who is uh, the president and CEO of Sphere One, which is one of these cooperatives that we've been talking about, a buying group that uh, you know in, inside the ecosystem uh, that was uh, providing training. And he thought one of the most valuable pieces that you could do inside a partner ch channel and partner training was the concept of organizing your content into these training plans. So that's kind of what Gavin was talking about, how engineers are you know, different than salespeople. And so they require sometimes common content, but different paths, different focus, different learning objectives, different practice, different uh, type testing things. 
And so what Rob was seeing, and you can listen to that podcast on talentedlearning.com, was that by creating training plans for your different types of partners, you could drastically reduce the time that it took them to get to proficiency and knowledge. And not only that, you could expand their knowledge. And so a good example that he gave was like, you might go in there and say, hey, I'm looking to buy this hammer drill. And then a well-trained person that went through a training plan could be like, wow, what are you using that for? Oh, you're putting in anchors. Well, that's wonderful. We sell anchors too. And uh, oh, they're going to be above your head. Well, you're going to need, you know, ladder and then safety harness gear also, which we you know, also represent. And so organizations are using these training plans to train their partners to not only just know this one product, but then how to add value in the process by learning more and more. And so uh, training plans that mix that content up and formal paths are a, a great tool in organizing the learning in an effective way, uh, other than just making it ad hoc at the time of need. So Gavin, tell us another story. Yeah, um, so here's another story with Grunt Boss and, and their, 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 their training um, uh, strategy. So, you know, Grunt, Grunt Boss had all this great training um, content to attract their technical prospects, their sales, but they had nowhere to put it, right? Um, so we created all this great stuff, nowhere to put it, nowhere to get it out there. So they were able to, once they brought it into the system, they were able to move it now. So all this great content they trained, they were able to move it through from the top of the funnel all the way to the bottom as they say, right, from prospect to sales to use. So they were able to create um, with some of the other things you've talked about, videos and, you know, the surveys and assessments, all the traditional things. Um, they actually have some live aspects of their training. They create certification programs. So now they're really engaging their end users. Not only have they personalized it to the different types in the different areas, but they've created certifications and badges where they can now say, hey, you're now certified on this product. And tying back to what you were talking with, Rob, uh, Rob Moen's Fear One, which is one of our, our you know, one of our customers, uh, they they were able to take all those training plans. They would take content from folks like uh, Grunt Boss and this and all the different suppliers and manufacturers and create these great training plans for all their distributors. And now they're seeing the benefit from beginning to end, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they can go from, like you said, I, I'm buying that drill, but hey, there's an anchor, hey, there's a this, there's a hammer, there's a that, um, all the way to the safety gear that's required. So a lot of a lot of manufacturers spend a lot of time creating this great content to talk about their products, to teach about their products, um, how to use their products, the safety aspects of their products, but they had nowhere to put it. And I come back to Grunt Boss, and that's where we're able to help them. We got it into the network, we put it in the network, and they're able to push it out there, right? Having that specialized training and put certifications behind it. So you know, by using the specialized training content as their strategy. They were able to increase their brand presence among all their key demographic and decision makers, you know, putting it to better use. You know, they were able to target early decision makers all the way down to the end users. Uh, they influenced the whole buying chain utilizing, you know, multiple aspects of the Blue Bolt system. You know, they, they don't sell to the end user, but they influence the end user, right, going through each part of that buying chain. Um, and again, it's one of those things where uh, we can talk numbers, right? They saw some great, 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 great ROI on that. So on average, what we've seen is, you know, anywhere between 15 and 21% increase in sales just by training somebody on your product. You know, as the saying goes, knowledge is power. And that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Let's keep moving on as we're closing in on about 15 minutes here. So we'll get some more of the, the good highlights here we wanted to share. Um, but let's talk about let's talk about learner engagement. Here's a, a, another uh, study about the, the time that organizations spend inside the, the buying process. For time's sake, we'll, we'll leave this here as a follow up afterwards. But it, just another reinforcement from Trust Radius this time that the time that they have for the selling and for the conveying value is so small that you have to make the most of it and you have to make it so that you can engage those voluntary learners those voluntary learners. that's the second key thing you know that you have to take away is is it's not just the concept of doing this now comes the instructional design the 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 fortitude the efficacy of the content in the eyes of that voluntary end learner so that you can get them exposed to the content they can get the learning they can actually do something change their behavior make it sell better service better see an impact and a reason for why to take that. 
but that's easier or not as easy as it sounds, as it turns out. So inside of your client base, there's a few strategies that you use to try to drive that voluntary engagement. And why don't you tell us about those, Gavin? Yeah, this is this is a really great one. You know, QR codes, a lot of folks think it's old technology, not really relevant anymore, but you'd be surprised how relevant it is still, right? We still go to the store, we still go to our, our hardware stores and we pick our product. Um, you know, some of our customers, as you see this QR code here, they'll take that QR code, they'll put it on the box, they'll put it on the instructions, they'll put it on their collateral. Um, and now they know who they're talking to, right? They know who's picking up their product. They're creating customized, personalized training. So um, for those of you out there, you can take a picture of this QR code and it takes you to a very specific place. It trains how to use QR codes in this specific case, but our, our manufacturers or suppliers, they'll, they'll, they'll say, how do you install that light switch? How do you install that, that pump, right? Um, they have all this great knowledge out there, but we got to just bring everything together, right? The traditional, the new, the modern, bring it all together and say, here's how you get to your end users to make sure that they understand your product. Um, and they can use your product because guess what? If they understand it, they're going to buy it. So you'll see these QR codes on some of our manufacturer products, and it's actually really cool. As much as people think it's old tech, it's actually still very relevant. Definitely, definitely, um, a great idea. We see it broader than uh, you know than just in the retail too. We see it a lot of times, and just in uh, servicing of complex you know equipment engines, generators, and things like that, like inside, you know, inside those units, putting QR codes for the actual service of changing this or that. So it's things that, uh, uh, you know, has a lot of different uh, uses inside the, the value chain. But one of the things that we struggle with as learning professionals, training channel and partner learners, or training somebody to learn a language, or training, teaching anybody anything, is the old forgetting curve. And, no, I forget what that no, I'm just kidding. The, the forgetting curve is uh, is that you know once you learn something, you know the time until you unlearn it or you forget it, you know, is is pretty fast. And so the way to overcome that is to try to keep on engaging the learner. And in the industry in general, there's a lot of different ways to do that. You guys came up with something called knowledge bumps. What's that mean? Yeah, you're absolutely right about that, that forgetting curve. You know, you see something once and it's, you know, you forget about it a couple of days, hours later, depending on how how uh, impactful it was. And we all can't be impactful all the time, right? Otherwise, as they say, if everything's unique, nothing's unique, right? Um, so that the knowledge bump, so, you know, if you talk about it in the constraints of learning, you know, you get in front of that person, they, they take that, you know, two to five minute course, they've got a good understanding. Knowledge bumps come out after that. You know, they're quick hits after that. They're basically lead engines at the end of the day. You're able to hit that person again and say, hey, you know, do you remember this? Do you want to think about that, whether statements or additional courses or questions or surveys? Uh, you can get that back on them. You know, a lot of times it's humor, practical exercises, as you said, um, just to reinforce something they've learned. You know, as they say, the more time somebody sees something, the more likely they are to remember. And that's what knowledge bumps are at the end of the day. They finish that course, you've got them in the door the first time, and now you're just reinforcing. You're you keep hitting them, you know, one hour, one day, one week after the fact to get them to remember that particular piece of content. Mm -hmm. For anybody that's learned or used uh, Babel or Duolingo uh, to learn a, a different language, uh, you're familiar without even knowing it of continuous learning and uh, that, that concept as they'll continue to. Uh, to bring uh, these different ideas forward and forward and forward until you you turn it into mastery, until you turn it into something like your name that you can't possibly forget anymore where the forgetting curve doesn't come. But one of the, the cool things in the industry is gamification. I love gamification. Uh, my friend is Dr. Carl Koppler here, one of the leaders in the industry on, the, uh, on developing the whole field of, of gamification. So it's something I've been paying attention to a lot and it can come in two different flavors. It could be gamification inside the actual content. So, you know, games or gamified learning as a way to teach. But then there's also gamification on a platform level, on a learning systems level. And those are things like having points or awards or leaderboards or contests or rewards or, or different things that you can do at a platform level, independent of any particular content uh, that uh, allows you to engage and, and create competition. And in the industry, there's a lot of different approaches, all correct to, for, to some degree on how you could use that to make a difference. Um, but Bluevolt, 
as uh, I have to say, the one that has the biggest dollars tied to it that I've ever seen in, in actual working in practice every day with lots of people that are spending rewards. Uh, really great uh, concept. How, how do your customers do that? What's what's your what's your take on gamification, Gavin? Gamification, no, and you're absolutely right with all all of that. Um, you know, you can gamify the courses, and and that's great, and that's awesome. But at the end of the day, um, my time is valuable. So is yours. So is the learners, right? Their time is valuable. So um, with incentivization, right? You got to give them a reason to take that course, right? Why take your course versus a competitor's course? Um, and blue box, as we call it, within our platform. Um, is a way for our suppliers to incentivize that user or that learner, whether it be the salesperson, the end user, the specify, the engineer, whatever it may be, get them to take your course. That That's the first thing, right? And we do that via Blue Box. Um, you know, it's cheaper than marketing, right, in, in, in dollars, advertising spend. But now you're actually creating that relationship with your user. You're giving them something and saying, hey, I value your time. I'm gonna ask you to take this course and understand my product. I'm gonna give you something for doing that. And one of the things we do, because we understand the ecosystem, um, you know, the, the the engineers, the end users, the sales folks, they can take courses from multiple manufacturers on their line card, and it adds up to real money at the end of the day, right? Um, but you're, you know, from a manufacturer's perspective, they're starting to create a relationship with that end user, and that goes a long way for the end user than anything else. And that end user not is not always the contractor. It's the salesperson, right? It's the it's the value added reseller, it's the manufacturer reps, it's everybody in that buying chain to create those relationships with them. Um, and we've seen Blue Box or this the incentive program that we have to be one of the biggest motivators for end users to take courses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great story. Go back to that podcast I did with Rob Mo uh, here from the Sphere One. Uh, here last week, and he was telling me just the story. So, what you give him, say you give him ten dollars, blue bucks, it's like the equivalent. You take this course and pass, we'll give you ten bucks, and they can use that throughout his network. Five or six years ago, they were paying out the the manufacturers were paying out like fifteen to eighteen k, and but everybody started getting in on it, and then with a good pandemic year, lots of time, they paid over a quarter million dollars out. Uh, to their learners through these rewards cards and yeah, that's serious money i just haven't seen anything like that in the industry to that tune you know maybe a a few thousand but a quarter million dollars of, of gamification rewards is just beyond the pale awesome um, tell us about milwaukee we're running out of time <laughs> yeah, milwaukee is another great story that we have uh, everything we've talked about they take advantage of every aspect of it whether it be uh, blue box in the network or training plans or, you know, uh, contractor portals versus sales portals. They've taken advantage of everything. Um, they have their quick hit videos where they're talking to their sales and distributor folks so they can get them through and understand their products um, all the way down to their contractors that actually use the products. At the end of the day, um, as we say, one knowledge is power. If I know about something, I'm going to talk about it. Milwaukee understood that over some time. Um, two, your time is valuable, as we just talked about. So let's make sure we give you something to make, you know, to 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 say, hey, take my course. And three relationships. That network matters, right? That network matters. Who I talk about, it matters. And if I create those relationships and I have that knowledge, it's gonna it's it's gonna create something for me. At the end of the day, that's gonna be sales, right? That's gonna be sales for my product. So they use everything on the platform. You know, um, uh, they use learning. As a marketing function and i think that's where a lot of folks get off the rails oh no learning is just for onboarding my employees i teach them their stuff and that's it no learning is a marketing function you know creating those short bite-sized personalized uh, uh training plans and content plans out there incentivizing your folks and then all the analytics that comes back from it you know there has to be something for me as a manufacturer for me as a distributor in it also right it's getting all the analytics back to say hey how are people taking my courses? Are they falling off halfway, right? Because they're not understanding, they're getting that survey back. And that's the other great part about uh, Milwaukee is they, they did that, but they also listened to their customers. They listened to their end users and they were able to iterate on all their training to better serve their customers. So that engaging content and understanding their customers, you know, help them to be, you know, Milwaukee where they are in the market. You know, different content types are different parts of the buying chain. And I think once you start to learn that, you can start to really create really positive relationships with your with your customers. 
Wow, outstanding. Well, I'm glad they're listening to me because I own a whole bunch of their 20 volt tool systems. So that's great. But geez, they have to be disappointed only having numbers like 366% as opposed to 700%. So we'll. Yeah, like I said, the opportunity's there. You just got to surface them up. <laughs> All right. So the last little piece. So where does this all, where does the rubber beat the road? So another organization here, the, the fourth uh, third party source here of just a, an organization all about, uh, or all about, excuse me, uh, talking about just what channel is measure. And so just look at this list right here. I'm sure everybody on this call is measuring some of this stuff. Overall partner certification, satisfaction, partner repurchase. These are typical channel performance. Guess what? Learning, training, certification impacts and can impact every one of those. How? LMS data is all your training data. Your CRM, PRM, ERP, that has all your business data. Chocolate and peanut butter, bring them together. That's learning analytics. And if you look at the combination of that data for trained versus untrained groups, you can see the difference in every one of those metrics or anyone that you have the capability to measure. And that difference is the impact of training in that channel partnership. If you're training certified partners or selling, you know, 25% more, then you can take that 25% and figure out exactly what the dollar value is of that. And you can see what you're spending to what you're getting, improve, improve, improve again. But how you do those analytics, that's variable. Gavin, how do you guys do it? Do you bring it into your system or do you pump your data out to somebody else's? No, we bring it all in, or we give the option to bring it all in, I should say, and a lot of a decent amount of our customers um, take advantage of that. So they're able to see the story from the beginning to the end and make decisions accordingly, right? Um, they're able to see, as you said, those trained versus untrained. They can see, hey, these are the folks taking my courses, you know, cashing in on those wonderful blue box and those intensive rewards, providing that back, and they're seeing, like I said, anywhere between 15 and 21 percent increase in, in their product sales on those on those um, on those brands where they're seeing it on the high side for the folks that are not yeah they're selling but they're not selling at the same level right so um, to your question they're able to bring in all that CRM ERP PRM data into the system merge it with all of their learning data and start to really see trends we're not just throwing it over the board and saying yeah we've got that ad on Facebook and that's the end of it they're tracking it they're seeing it they're seeing it from beginning to end because when they bring in that sales data, that's where they see that training turned into a sale. I've made some money off that. I gave a buck and I gave you know ten dollars in blue bucks, but I got to sell X number of products. You know, so they're seeing the ROI on their investments in real time from beginning to end. So the visual, we're we're, we're talking about the future, right? Today, today's today. It is going to be what it's going to be. Let's set ourselves up for a really good future. Is what what we try to get our customers to do. Wow. Wow. Well, everybody that follows Talented Learning here on a regular basis, this is like music to our ears here, things we talk about all the time. But this showing the measurable result of, of training is what makes this all this a viable field and why everybody is worried about it and why every organization is thinking about developing their channel better. As we said multiple times today, not just because it's fun, but because it makes a measurable impact. It's a competitive differentiation in industry. It allows you to compete against your competitors better. Training your channel allows you to increase your revenue. It allows you to increase your customer satisfaction. It allows you to streamline your business processes throughout rolling out new products, uploading and onboarding channels, expanding globally all in a measurable way all that can be traced back to actual dollars and cents or euros or whatever it is on what you're spending to what you're getting in that closed loop system inside that ecosystem your partner ecosystem that's some powerful stuff and that's why hopefully we gave you today some ideas to think about it at kind of a one-to-one -one level but more importantly how to think about it at that broader ecosystem level so that you can really squeeze and maximize those benefits that come to your organization uh, through that strategic application of, of, of training to your diverse channel partners. Some key takeaways, it's no longer voluntary, or it's voluntary learners, but channel learning isn't voluntary. It's mandatory for the organization to do it, regardless if your organ your learners are, are voluntary uh, and need to be enticed. But the four keys to your success are to identify, maximize that ecosystem, develop a content strategy, that allows you to develop content once and use it across the different uh, ecosystem components. Think about from the very beginning how to engage, motivate, motivate, motivate learners to come to 
launch courses to complete courses and to sell your products or service your products measure and improve and measure and improve and uh, we answered a couple of questions right through the, thin, uh, the, the uh, theme of this uh, indirectly as I, I asked Gavin however there's a few that we didn't get to we'll follow up individually to make sure that we get your questions answered if you go to talentolearning.com we've got two real good uh, recent posts right at the top here there's the podcast that I've been referring to that was really good uh, with Rob Moe and then another one talking about mapping your ecosystem with a little bit more information and finally thank you for listening thank you for attending on a, another monthly webinar uh, we're going to follow up uh, via email uh, that'll have the recording or access to this recording please follow uh, gavin and myself on linkedin and you can uh, do it through those links right there or you can send us an email if you have any questions especially if you're watching this down the road uh, when it's in the on-demand format and then uh, finally, Leap Ahead, last, uh, Gavin, thank you, attendees, thank you. Uh, last plug for Leap Ahead, speaking of virtual conferences. Yeah, we've got a Leap Ahead conference coming up in June and everybody, uh, you're all invited <laughs> to come and take a look. Uh, understand how we do channel, uh, channel learning, channel partnerships, and even hear from some of our customers on what they're doing right and what we're doing wrong. No, um, <laughs> what they're doing right and how they're, um, uh, uh, talking to their their customers outstanding outstanding so we'll send that along we'll give you a link uh in the the follow-up email too so you can go and check out that agenda uh, but hopefully you found some value today and learning about the, the partner ecosystem and gavin thanks so much for joining me today and sharing your expertise it was great to have you and great to learn from you thank you thanks john thanks everyone thanks everyone have a great day